And so uh, during my time at Kiko, I uh, started the ambassador program, which I know there's some awesome ambassadors in the audience. So we have uh, folks from UT Austin, raise your hand when you're here at UT Austin, UNC Chapel Hill, Duke University, yeah. William and Mary, uh, Michigan State University, and uh, I know that uh, and the University of Pittsburgh, which is super awesome. Make sure you say hi to all of them. They're doing great work on college campuses. And then now, you know, Christine was like, well, now that you're gone, I'm going to hire two people instead of you. And I was like, where, where was my help when I was working for you? Uh, so we have two people who are helping run the ambassador program who are doing awesome work. They're in alliteration, so you can see to remember their name. So Joy and Julie, who have been running the show from the back. They're the ones running the ambassador program. Talk to them. They know all of the things. Julie used to be an ambassador. Like, she's been on the ground. Joy has been working with a lot of young people. I really hope you're super excited about doing this work. So, I want to level set this panel, this awesome panel of amazing people, um, with some data around youth voting for, a for Asian Americans. And so, I learned about a study called the National Study. Come on, you can do this. One day. Okay, maybe. Oh, 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 did it work? Skip two. Oh, oh, skip two. <sighs> okay. Maybe, Joy, if you could, thanks. All right. Uh, so, I have this, there's a study called the National Study for Learning Voting Engagement. I don't know if you all are familiar. It's called EDSOL. And um, on this study, it's housed out of the Institute of Democracy and Higher Education at Tufts University. Um, it can map out who is voting on college campuses. So in your task, how you figure out you voting is you kind of like look at the closest polling locations to college campuses, parse out 18 to 24, and you're like, those are college students. But that's not that accurate, right? Because not everyone goes to college, and not all these people, like if you're in close proximity to multiple campuses, it doesn't really work. So the study that was founded in 2012 compares the van to student enrollment. So then you're able to see exactly who on those campuses are voting. And the really cool thing is that on those college campuses, depending on the information they give us, you can see it's aggregated by race, you can see it's aggregated by class, like, like freshman, sophomore, not socioeconomic status, um, by field of study, all of these really awesome things. And so there's over a thousand campuses participating, over 10 million students are in this study, and out of those 10 million students and 1,000 campuses, 14% of those are Asian American. And I want to caveat this that I put in an inquiry with IDHC who runs the study about Pacific Islander data, but unfortunately, we have a limited amount of data there because the clearinghouse who holds all of this data doesn't give, like, they're the ones that hold all the data, and sometimes they just don't give it to us. And so, unfortunately, I only have one slide about Pacific Islanders and Native Hawaiians. Which is this one? Um, um, but I am keep, I will keep looking, and I'm going to keep advocating during my position here at YI to make sure that there's some Pacific Islander data coming into 2020 and 2018. And so the slide that you're seeing here, uh, I learned from Eric that you have to compare apples to apples. And so this is 2014 data on college campuses, and you can see that Asian Americans voted at a woo, eight percent. So high, great job, y'all. Um, and so eight percent for Asian Americans in Native Hawaiians. Which it is pretty low, but I wanted to give some more information and context to this. And so this is 2014, and so in 2016 they actually made a lot of groundbreaking uh, numbers that went up. But at the same time, if you see on the next slide, we're still Asian students on college. Oh, that's not it. Okay. Asian students on college campuses are still 2.5 times less likely to vote compared to white students. And so when you see our voter turnout, though, even though we're still 2.5% less likely in, oh, too fast, come back, come back, go one more. Oh, there you go, stay there. Oh, wait up, let me go forward. Uh, <laughs> one hour. Sorry, Patty, we're fighting. You have to take your control now. Oh, okay. Well, We'll find all the slides if you can't see them, but essentially, uh, in 2016, we could see that Asian Americans were able to vote 7.8 percent higher than 2012. So it went from 23.3 percent to 31.1 percent, with an increase of 7.8 percent, which is the largest uh, increase in voting in all racial groups, which is super exciting. And also, when we talk about vote share, I don't know if Eric shares about things about vote share. Essentially, we talk like who votes. We were able to double our size in the vote share of college campuses from 1.9% to 3.8%. So we are growing. There are more Asian Americans voting on college campuses. And if you keep on 
trucking, you might see some slides. You also see, for those who are familiar with Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander serving institutions, there's 30 campuses who are part of that program. This shows the vote share. Um, they are also the largest uh, increase in voting out of all of the minority serving institutions with an increase of 4.1%. And so you can see, oh thanks, oh perfect. Uh, you can see that there's all of this really awesome data showing that Asian Americans are turning out to vote in 2016. So how do you keep this momentum up? And so uh, if you see on two slides for now, um, the, there is an index called the Youth Electoral Significance Index. Has anyone heard of this? <coughs> I'm so excited to send you all new information. Uh, so essentially, there's this group called Circle who did an evaluation of all of the, the densities of youth voting across the country. And you can see on the next slide that out of the, oh, one more. I don't know what's happening. Ten, the, uh, these are the top 10 congressional districts where you can see that there's going to be a significant impact of voting if young people decide to vote in these elections. And if you know from looking in this room, nine out of 10 of these congressional districts are conveners. And so it shows that you all are in a place of power where you can help work with and alongside young people to make a significant impact in some of these congressional races. And if you see on the next slide, you can see that these are the, the races where the governor and Senate federal races where there can be some significant impacts in youth turnout, um, if they turn out, and how they can be a large part of the vote share. And so now you know a little bit about how we're voting on college campuses, where are we having impact for young people, and if you all want more information, please let me know. I can send you all the information um, that I can possibly give. But I will also uh, start the panel with one closing thought from a paper that came out from a group called Ideas42, which posits that uh, young people have just as much mental barriers than physical barriers to voting. So it's not just about the physical barriers, but how difficult it is to vote. Um, and so they have three things that I wanted to highlight from that study uh, when you think about the, the questions that we're gonna have on this panel. And that's the three big reasons why students mentally are not prepared to vote. And one is that they don't identify themselves as voters. Because we think of them as young voters, we don't think of them as first time voters. And so when you think of how difficult it was the first time you vote as young people, what does that identity look like? And then the second piece is students overestimate the difficulties of voting because you're like, oh, we have to register here, we have to be a panel here, we have to go over here. Like, there's a lot of difficulties, and they overestimate it, and then they psych themselves out from participating. Mm -hmm. The last is students don't don't link political participation to voting, and so you're seeing a lot of these actions happening. How does this relate back to civic engagement and political participation? And so I'm not talking about your rock star volunteers, like our ambassadors think about these things all the time. I'm thinking about the students who are maybe in STEM or like people who are not part of the political process. These are the reasons that bar them from voting. And so when we talk about this panel today and you hear from these amazing speakers about how to work with young people, think about not just the physical barriers that are stopping students from voting, but also the mental ones. And so to start off, I'm trying to see who's on the panel. All right, so we're gonna, I'm gonna quickly introduce them and then we're gonna go straight into questions and I wanna hear questions from you all. So I'm gonna start with Amna, so Amna led a multitude of, she is the executive director of API Vote Michigan, and she led a multitude of community groups and nonprofits with a deep commitment to wanting to help create spaces where everyone feels like they truly belong. Her experience as, as a third culture kid with a commitment to empowerment um, via education and engagement brought her to API Vote Michigan. She's currently uh, a board member of a deal fellow, which is the Detroit Equity and Action Lab, and on the leadership team of the beloved community, a board member and a board member of Michigan United. Um, and then the next person is Sabrina. She is one of our ambassadors at the UNC University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She's a senior studying in media and journalism. Um, and at UNC, she works at the API Working Group, so she's one of the students who are fighting for Asian American studies on college campuses, so shout out to her. Um, and she's working to connect civic engagement to the political power of students on these college campuses. Um, and she also serves on the East Coast Asian American Student Union National Board. Um, the next person is Jonavi. Hi, Jonavi. She is a government and planning Planning to honor senior at the University of Texas at Austin, and she's the director of operations for the Asian and Desi Pacific Islander American Collective, or ASPAC, agency under UT Austin's Multicultural Engagement Center, along with her co ambassador, Quinan, who's over there. She's worked to increase voter registration among her peers, so she's another rock star ambassador of ours. 
The next is Debbie. Debbie's a community activist over in Houston. Um, and so she works with OCA Asian Pacific American Advocates for 20 plus years, an expert in government contracting and supply diversity. Debbie started as a student leader at UT Austin. So we got like two folks from UT Austin here advocating for Asian American student, Asian American studies, the study center, right? And then hiring Asian API mental health counselors including aid guys in scholarship consideration. She's also serving as the OTA Greater Houston chapter president, as well as the Houston culture convener. Ex-president. Ex-president. You're right. Cool. <laughs> also, we have JP in the back from Korean Resource Center. She's the executive director and formerly the Orange County director and campaign manager at the, at the Buena Park office, building and training a local and progressive base of Korean Americans to work on issues across Orange County. Before working at KRC, he started his work in politics at the Bus Federation Civic Fund in Portland, Oregon, serving as their operations manager until December of 2014. So, I wanted to blow through all of those intros so we can get through to specifically the questions. And so I have specific questions for each of you because you all do amazingly different work. And so I kind of want to start off with John Aviv. Can you share about, like, as a student, how do you talk to your peers about voting and civic engagement? And specifically, how do you encourage other APIs to volunteer to support your efforts in voter engagement? Hello. Is this working? Oh, do I push? Hello? No. Can you click it? <laughs> I'm gonna help. Hello? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Can you repeat the question? How do you <laughs> wow, it was so eloquently said. Um, how do you work with your members at UT Austin to like uplift their work, work with them to talk about civic engagement, and then how do you get them to do that next step about volunteering? Yeah, so for context, UT Austin has a really high Asian American population. It's about twenty percent of our student body. However, um, it's not at all in a sort of coalition or any sort of thing. There's a lot of people in a lot of different sectors, like in sororities and fraternities, also just in cultural organizations. So the way that we've worked um, alongside them is that we have specifically um, contacted them um, and emailed them and gone to their meetings to work with them and register, register them to vote and then also work towards educating them because I think there's definitely a mental block between um, seeing all this stuff on social media and learning about issues while also like actually understanding like what it means to be a voter. So we try to give them the opportunity to be registered to vote and um, and then we, you know, try to start with that. Yeah, it's like all about those three yeses, right? Like, oh, you want to register to vote? Yeah. Oh, like, do you know your election on November 6th? Yeah. Oh, wait. Okay, so keep saying yes. Okay, so like, do you want to volunteer for us? Yeah. Okay, keep asking until they say three no's, and then you can really get, get a lot of volunteers out there, right? Yeah, and also, so we have a pretty large amount of people who are actually registered to vote, but there's definitely a lack of people who actually um, participate in the voting process. So like, working with that and like, Engagement with them on issues that they care about is what we really try to do. And speaking of issues, I know I'm gonna you do a really cool uh, like program that is like the Youth Leadership Corps. Can you share a little bit about that? Because you told me about how you're really able to align the values piece to getting them to, to participate. Um, Yes, no, maybe. No. Why is it only our panel? <laughs> <laughs> I can see you don't push the button, it's supposed to be great. What do you want to talk about this one? So we have a youth leadership corps, which is a group of high school students mostly. This year we do have a freshman college student, but it essentially was designed for high school students. <coughs> And in 2012, API Vote Michigan had done a needs assessment of Southeast Michigan, Asian American, and Pacific Islanders. And one of the things that had come up consistently was that parents and youth both had said there was a lack of leadership development programs. And uh, through focus groups, we realized that it wasn't just a leadership development, it was also sort of this lack of identity around Asian Americans, because the population is not dense. And so you would find many students where they're the only Asian American in their class. 
So they don't necessarily identify as Asian American in that in that process. And the Youth Leadership Corps brings the young people together with a facilitator who is no more than two years older than them, um, where it's essentially youth-led. So they come together, they go through some modules around identity, Asian American power building, what, what the demographics of the state are, things like that, and uh, sort of stories about Asian American and Pacific Islander heroes internationally as well as in the United States, specifically in the Midwest. From that, they actually go through issue identification on things that they care about. So we don't give them an agenda or say that these are things that you need to work on. They come up with what they would like to work on. They come to adult allies in terms of after identifying resources that they need. And then together, uh, we really work together. It's not like they work uh, for us or based on what I as leadership or others on staff, other adults on staff feel that they should do. They then decide how they're going to move that forward with um, a civic engagement and power building agenda. So it's been incredibly powerful. Uh, this last cycle for the 20, 2018 primary that we just had on August 7th, we actually had young people who called me after hours, way after phone banking and canvassing shifts were over, and said, hey, um, and are we going to get in trouble? Uh, I just completed my turf. Can you check on the minivan? It, I think I'm done. It's 100 percent. And this uh, young person had actually just discovered, just figured out that some of the homes left on his shit on his turf were close to where he lived, and so he decided to go and uh, knock those doors when there wasn't a canvassing shift going on. So it was really powerful to see how much ownership they took, um, and we're really proud of them. And looking forward to learn quite a lot from them, actually. I'm very well aware that I'm the, now the old fuddy-duddy on staff, so looking happily to be a de-seated. <laughs> no, I'm going to hoard the power. Oh, you can moderate it. Cool. Uh, well, speaking about ownership and like talking about that power piece, I know, JP, during your time at KRC, can you share about how like some of the projects you've done to help give ownership to young people, as well as like how do you meld that Korean identity to that civic engagement identity? Sure. So, um, you know, I, I, I need to provide a context of when I came actually back to Orange County. I'm actually born and raised in Orange County. I actually started organizing in the Pacific Northwest um, back in 2011. And I think what the first thing I realized coming from youth organizing and youth civic engagement spaces in back to Orange County was that there was a lot of reliance on young leadership to be able to actually aim for the work back in 2000, early 2015 without a lot of support for young organizers to be able to actually learn how to be able to run lead campaigns and to be able to mobilize at the scale that we were looking for unless you were part of a four-year institution or unless you were part of student, student associations. There were very little space to be able to do that, especially for Asian American students and young people. And so I think for us, for me personally, coming from that background, realized that there was an opportunity to be able to help provide a space for young Asian Americans across the county to be able to understand what it means for us to be able to mobilize, to be able to run campaigns, to be able to build and center campaigns around young people's issues in, in the county that had been led by white supremacists still to this day. And so for us right now, in terms of our in terms of our work, in terms of centering the work, what we have prioritized was to be able to create a space for some of the most vulnerable, impacted young Asian American or Americans across the county, whether that, that means that it was around immigration, whether that means it was around housing, whether that meant around student or education access, to be able to actually center the issues that we were actually facing across the county uh, and the untold stories that we were hearing. Students that had to be able to take gap years after every year because they weren't at, they weren't actually eligible for the California Dream Act and NC tuition or financial aid. Uh, students who um, you know couldn't afford to be able were actually going to school far away from home, so they couldn't like they were living out of their car. You know, a lot of these students right now that we were actually finding to be able to actually send the issues that were from the most vulnerable vulnerable populations in the county. And so for us, when we, when we actually started doing a lot of the work, we wanted to be able to create a space 
that didn't just focus on student mobilization to the polls, but really created like a holistic model for all of us to be able to understand what it meant to be able to build power from our culture and our community, understanding that culture actually leads into mobilization in the field. Culture actually leads to be able to actually empower folks to be in a rally. Having a Korean drum and being able to drum at a rally actually empowers folks to be able to actually participate into an elevated level of leadership and civic participation. And so for me, I think for us, well, we, you know, we really started with a volunteer program in the summer with seven, seven students from across the county. And the county is about 3 million people, the sixth largest county in the country. And so we're actually talking about a pretty, you know, a pretty, pretty minimal program that was like staffed half time by me over the course of the summer. And really started with uh, a, a curriculum that really centered identity politics, also with civic engagement tools, as well as being able to integrate culture. And really, really, I mean, our first campaign registered, I think, 529 voters with seven volunteers in the first year. Uh, just to give scale now, uh, in the last 10 days when we actually started our campaign around voter registration, we just broke our 2300 voter registration mark with, um, in coalition with two other youth organizing partners across the county who have participated in the summer program that we built in large part because of the fact that now there is a priority for young voters and young voters of color to have a space and understand the civic engagement and the total strategies are the way to be able to, are a part of building power that we want to be able to have. And now there's like young people now more engaged now more than ever to be able to engage in civic engagement just beyond issues. Who is our leadership? Why is our leadership not representing who we are? Um, and so I think for us, what I, I believe is the culture that we're changing beyond the culture of our identity is the culture that we're changing is that we have a responsibility as organizations to be able to ensure that young people have not only have a place in the movement, but can be centered as a part of the leadership about, about the radical change that we want to be able to see over the course of the next 30 years. Um, that's kind of the responsibility and precedent that we're trying to establish right now in a time that's so hard. And so for me, uh, that's the thing that I'm most proud of, being part of KRC, to be able to help build that project, to be able to understand that like our interns that were from here for two years ago are now actually leading our programs for the, this summer and leading the campaigns in the fall. Our interns from last year are actually growing up our high school program where we started with five volunteers last year and have now grown to 35 active volunteers who come twice a week. Um, these are the programs that we're actually building in terms of leadership infrastructure that allows people to dream, be able to provide the infrastructure and support for the programs they want to build, and mean, in the meantime, being able to grow our capacity to be able to run election work at a scale that we've never seen before. And so that's the thing that I'm most proud of and excited for. I hope that answers the question. But I'm um, happy to be able to answer any questions as a follow -up. And I think it's totally awesome when you're talking about how like them identifying themselves as like powerful and creating those political power spaces for them and now being able to recruit and being part of that movement with all of these other young folks. And so I think that this kind of leads into some of the work that Debbie does because I know Debbie you've done a lot of work doing like high school conferences and then when they graduate from high school you work with them in college and you kind of build that pipeline to ultimately come back to the greater Houston area. So can you share a little bit about how do you get young folks to be working with you to build that pipeline and also to come back home to help support the work uh, after they've graduated. I spent a lot of money on boba tea. <laughs> um, over the years, uh, you know, OC has grown a program for high school students and college uh, affiliates over decades. Uh, but this past year, we decided to scale up and partner actually with another organization, Mi Familia Vota, the Latinx community, to combine or, or work in partnership with our youth programs. So they have ELL, which is Emerging Latino Leaders, and then we have YELS, which is Young Emerging Leaders and Scholars. And so by combining that program, um, we've turned it into a year-round program where we meet with the students once a month, second Saturday morning from 9 to 2. We incorporate uh, leadership and organizing training in that, and then uh, we have career roundtable lunches so that students have an opportunity to talk with someone who went to a different school, uh, works in a different career, so that um, from the Asian side, we had to, to convince our, our Latin partners that this is something that's going to help us get Asian students to come out, right? We want you to be a strong organizer, but we want you to be successful you know, in the future, and someone who's successful who actually comes back and reinvests themselves in the community. 
Um, so that's kind of our philosophical take on it. Uh, it culminates in a summer youth summit for one week, and we're hoping to be able to expand that um, so that we have a more robust summer program. Because this summer we did that, and then we actually just had uh, students who were involved in it come out and do voter registration with us through the summer. Um, the, the real benefit of this program was that we looked at the future of the demographics of Houston, right? Right now, we're only at maybe 6%. Theoretically, after the census, it'll be higher, but the projection is that by 2030, we're going to be at 11, somewhere between 11 to 13% of the city. And yet, our community votes at the lowest rate compared to, and almost equivalent to the Latinx community. So the future of power, at least in Houston and Texas, there's a real possibility and opportunity for the Asian community to be there. But in order for us to be there, we have to have those partnerships. So beyond just the youth training program, we've trained the students to actually then go back into their high schools to create civic engagement clubs. So we're currently at six schools. Our goal for this year is to be in 12 schools. Um, we spent the better part of last year just trying to get into Fort Bend ISD. We're in HISD, and now we're going into Fort Bend ISD. Um, next will be Ailey, right? And the goal of this is to have the students themselves become the, the cheerleaders and the organizers, so that they themselves are then turning around and getting their peers to register to vote and be more civically engaged and become active in the community. So like, for example, the youth summit training that we did, we did storytelling, right? We had, you know, a Y advocate, from, we had staff from the national office come down. We had the moth come down from New York to do a training. Um, but the highlight of it was that we put them all on buses and took them down to go see the toxic waste sites around Houston. They participated in an Air Alliance you know, press conference this week. We have uh, significant challenges after Harvey uh, in, you know, uh, related to the rebuild. So we wanted the students to experience that. Um, our goal ultimately is this is building an army for the future. Right. It's an army for the Latinx community. It's an army for the API community. We anticipate being able to bring on other communities into this so that in the future, that pipeline of leadership they all know each other. The majority of these students are going to go to Texas schools. When they come out, hopefully they will come back to our organizations to be engaged in the community. Okay. But the, the side benefit of all this is that it opened doors for us as an Asian American organization to be in those spaces. Whereas before, I may know a lot of different people in the city, but to be asked to be at the table to represent the API community, so you know, thanks to culture, we were able to form a civic engagement table. So it's the Houston API table. It's really it's a happy table. And all the people who work together, we are the happy team on the happy plan. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's memorable in Houston. And so we now have the space at those tables. And I really like when you were talking about like entering high school spaces, right? Because I mentioned before, one of the mental barriers to having young people going out to vote is not identifying as voters themselves. And so when you're starting in high school as a peer-to-peer -peer conversation, like then as they go into college, like they are like, oh, I am a voter. I gotta like, you know, change my like voting location, get all these things ready, and they identify right from high school, which is really cool. And so I think like how you were able to train your volunteers to go into these high schools is kind of similar to what the work is going on in North Carolina. And so in North Carolina, we have an interesting relationship where an API vote ambassador, so Sabrina at UNC, and also Duke University works with NCAT. I don't have NCAT here. Paula, if you're here, um, which is a national coalition of Asian Americans working together, something like that. And so, North Carolina, oh crap, sorry. Um, and so they all work together in this really unique way where like NCAT provides some of the trainings and Sabrina, correct me if I'm wrong, and then you all are helping and having that relationship. So can you share a little bit about how that really unique relationship works and how do you use your work time fighting for Asian American studies? How does that relate all back to all of this? Yeah, I can talk about that. So I really actually... Okay, so... Here you go. <laughs> All right, so 
A lot of what NCAT does provide us with is the training and resources to be able to do effective voter registration work. Um, something that we benefited from last year was the national summit that API Vote let us do, I think this was around the same time last year, and we learned a lot. It was a lot of national work as well, but then being trained by NCAT on North Carolina specific <laughs> things that we just didn't know about, filling out like the forms, there's certain fields that in North Carolina are required that aren't nationally. I think, for example, phone number isn't one of them. There's a lot I forgot for now, but there's things that we didn't know to tell people were things that just were North Carolina specific that we wouldn't have known otherwise. And this kind of relates to the way that Catherine mentioned that a lot of us are first time voters. And I think that people forget that. Like there's so many things that we care about, but don't, participate in and then I lost my train of thought. It's like when we're first time voters, there's so many things that we don't know about what goes into the process and how to recruit more people and what goes on the ballot form specifically. And it kind of really helps us with our messaging and then training people to be on the field to do that properly. And as well as like they funded us on a lot of things that people come out to, such as specific events. They help us host ramen making bars or like uh, we're having a hot pot event come up soon that's really exciting that brings out students to like reels them in something that people are interested in in our campuses so they actually register to vote and then we have conversations with them while they're there that inspire them to participate and then how this relates all back to our work as the API working group something that we are fighting for Asian American studies, and that's somewhat disjoint from civic engagement, and I think some people are like confused on how they relate, but something that I've been thinking a lot about is that it's that it has a lot to do with coalition building and then getting people to care and then fight for what they want. Something that people have been saying is like, oh, Asian American studies, it'll happen eventually, right? Because it's like a nationwide movement, but everything that we have at UNC right now, such as like, we do have ethnic studies, but not for Asian Americans. People think like, oh, then Asian American studies will happen eventually, but that's not true because everything that we have, people fought for. And so like, we, it relates back to civic engagement because a lot of what we've learned from working with APIO and NCAT is how to inspire people and get them to care and then making a change, like harnessing community power, working with other coalitions, like we're forming coalitions with other student groups, working with other communities, such as black and brown communities around campus, and like working with each other, beside each other to make a change. And I, I would say that I think that fighting for Asian American studies is a form of civic engagement because you are building power on your campus. And that's the same way that all of these folks are building power in, in the government, right? So your government is like your administration. And so like this is your practice round. And then when you go out, you're still fighting for Asian American studies, having everyone fight for it after you graduate. But then also now you have the tools and resources to run for office. And then also, <laughs> also like fight for the things that you care about in, in local, state, and federal governments. I also want to highlight some of the cool events that our ambassadors have done. It's like they, they really like alliterations like FOBA and Dallas. So like you write like a lot of people buy FOBA for college students. And so they're like able to work, give people FOBA, rope them in, and then talk about some of the ballot measures. And then they also had ramen registration, which you get ramen and you register them to vote. And so these are some of the really cool ideas that the ambassadors have been able to create to help bring in that conversation and having them reaffirm this identity of voters. And so those are all the questions I had because I wanted to give space for audience questions. So does anyone have any questions? Go ahead. I was curious to know if you have any examples where you've engaged international students in civic engagement work. I mean, that's a big untapped resource in many of our communities because there are universities and colleges near our respective organizations and where we are. So. Doesn't that be everyone, but whoever feels like they <laughs> We haven't engaged intentionally, but we do every year. <laughs> it's just like I think, um, especially in the in, in the climate in Orange County electorally right now, it's always an interest for international students to be able to engage even further than we have before. Um, and so I, I think it's all it it changes our curriculum, it changes the purview, of, especially for the rest of the folks who are locally from Orange County, in large part because of the fact that they're sharing a dynamic and a purview that that really comes removed from 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 growing up. 
uh, in our local area. Um, I, I think oftentimes there are actually a lot of our international student members are actually some of the most excited to be in the field in large part because they're like engaging in a process in a process of a democracy that may look different from from a home country or, or otherwise. And so I, I, I don't think it's ever been like an intentional outreach necessarily on campus or things like that, but it certainly is something that we do every year and kind of adapt and grapple with every year. The international students that we've been able to get involved um, have tended to be the Chinese international students. Um, surprisingly, mostly from mainland China. There's usually a handful, and the only two things they come out to do are either because we're paying them to come and do phone banking in language, um, and then two, the ones who actually have come to volunteer on a more consistent basis is through our citizenship program. So like, if I sell it to them as you're coming to help a senior fill out their citizenship application, I'm actually surprisingly able to get people to come and volunteer for that. Also, I would want to plug, so something that got released earlier this year out of Florida is a, a website called Love Votes. And so Love Votes uh, are folks who are not eligible to vote, whether they're being international or undocumented, talking about what are their experiences around civic engagement and like why, even though they can't vote, like their friends can vote on their behalf through the, the values and that they care about. And so if you all want to see that website, it has some really powerful stories from folks who are not eligible to vote. Um, I saw another question on there. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is really particularly around high school students. I'm not sure if because I'm in Irvine, California, this is a unique experience for me, but how do you deal with high school students who are not that engaged, but are forced to do this through their parents for <laughs> community service? And then how do you manage this? Because I feel dealing with the parents actually takes up a great majority of the time, and then hounding me to sign papers to, for presidential service award, you just name it, and maybe it's just the area I had with really hyper-aggressive Korean parents, but um, I, so I mean, and, and that's what I'm experiencing is just the frustration of dealing with the parents themselves and not truly engaged students. So how are you managing it and what's the secret sauce so I can learn from that? So I don't know that there's a secret sauce. Uh, I will say that obviously our group is not as popular as yours because I don't have as many parents hounding me for their children or their students participating. Uh, what I will say is that we start off in the summer and uh, it gives parents and students sort of an opportunity to taste the flavor of what, what the students will be doing and what kind of commitment we're expecting. Uh, we do, we have an urban setting, but it's like uh, students participate from the suburbs as well. So those parents do do more of the driving. Um, and I hate to say it, but this really hasn't been an issue in that we've had maybe like the most ever was 2017 was a bad year where we had maybe five students drop off. Otherwise, really, our cohort only decreases by one or two for the academic year. So students participate in the summer and then they continue during the academic year. And at the end of the summer, I mean, anybody can drop out is technically at any time. We can't force them to stay. But generally what's happened is that at the end of the summer, some of the students say, this is too much of a commitment. We can't do it through the academic year and they drop off. But uh, typically student engagement has been pretty high. So I'm sorry, I can't really help with that, but uh, we, you know, there has been a couple of occasions where parents have not understood what exactly is going on. And so I've just taken some time to sit down and explain the curriculum to them and answer their questions. And I'll be honest, there's the, the hardest thing that we've ever faced is suburban parents wanting to move the program to their suburb <laughs> because they either don't want to drive or they're afraid of the city or whatever it is. And, and so we just haven't, we basically haven't given in. 
So it's been a choice for the family then whether they want to continue. But we were very intentional about making Detroit a seat of the program. Mm. Yeah. For our program, the summer summit, they have to apply. We don't just take every student who registers. Like there's a whole application process. They have to write an essay um, of like what they hope to get out of this um, and how you know, they're going to go back and, and take what they've learned and apply it, right? So that's a weeding out process in itself that really gets you, the kids who are more inclined to have drunk the Kool-Aid. Um, the monthly trainings um, are open to any student, right? Plus the students who went through that. And I'm typically okay with the students that get forced there by their parents, because that's my opportunity to get them to drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to reach them at all. And if they are around other students who have already drunk the Kool-Aid, they're more likely to, to become someone who wants to drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, I look at it as an opportunity. So I don't worry about the parents. I'm fine with signing any paper. Like your kid was here for two hours, three hours. You came to help stuff backpacks. He helps to do whatever manual labor. Because I look at it this way. I want to get the opportunity to to be able to impact that kid, right? That student for them to become more engaged potentially. They get the opportunity to be exposed to other students who are really into this. Um, and then three. So what if I'm signing a paper for two hours or four hours? I just got two to four hours of free manual labor to go out and register somebody, right? Maybe they're not as productive as somebody who is really into it. Maybe they're only going to get that one voter registration versus somebody who got five in that hour. It's okay. It's still something, and it's still an experience for them so that overall we still benefit. It's a part of our philosophy is we can't expect everybody to already be woke or understood or understand, right? We have to have a way to bring everyone else along with us. I also just want to highlight a story that when I was doing Norman Y training over at uh, UNA, uh, uh, ACDC in Las Vegas, I was talking to some high school students there. And they initially were just there because they were like, oh, my friends are here. i got to like come hang out. But also, like, they, like most students now are more invested, more interested in current events, more in, entwined with all of the work than any generation before because of the expanse of the internet. And so everyone cares about something. It's just about what can you kind of poke and prod until you can have that conversation. Gun violence is something that is incredibly important to young people right now. Whether they are for it or against it, it's something that's really important and everyone has an opinion. People care about how access to college, and like some of these things that they care about in the back of their mind, but have no outlet to have that conversation. And so when you have these folks who, if you already assume that they're apathetic, then they're going to continue to be apathetic. But if you have that conversation about, like, what are some of the things that, did you see on the news? Like, this morning, I just saw that there was another shooting, right? How, how, how is this conversation going to happen? Like, how, how are you feeling? And so when we have a conversation with the student of just, how are you feeling about this? then you'll be more surprised about the work that they do. And you can translate that to, oh, you want to do this? Do you know that this is a policy that can be changed? Policies are tied to lawmakers. Lawmakers, who votes for them? We're their hiring committee. So if we are their hiring committee, then we need to show up. And so like, how do we find those issues and turn that into a community? Sorry, I'm a moderator. I should be answering questions. <laughs> who else has a question? Go ahead. Um, hi, I have a question like, can, um, about, like, oh, you want to give me your mic? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Who wants to be up? Um, hi, um, I have a question uh, about, like, the third generations um, of the AIPI young people because they sometimes not very um, detached with the AIPI identity. They are more Americanized, so it may be sometimes hard to them to identify themselves with the AIPI group. So um, do you have any good advice on how to engage these kind of young people? Um, John, do you, Sabrina, do you have some thoughts on that since you work directly with some students who are second or third generation? Not to put you on the spot, even though you look like, dang. Yeah. Well, so I think what's really important 
I think Sabrina talked about it, is like having things like conversations or having classes like Asian American Studies. UT Austin is really lucky to have the only center for Asian American Studies in the South, which is like kind of a terrible, like it's kind of an indictment on like how terrible the situation is, but we have those classes and we have like a major, we have a minor, like having like classes like that and having like, you know, requirements that those classes fulfill that are attached to that is actually really important. It's like being able to learn our history through history classes through classes that engage with our culture is like actually very eye-opening for us so i think that's something that's really important i think also just like it just in, there's a lot of groups on different college campuses i'm just going to say that probably have these conversations and i think it's it's maybe not on those students because i think students have like a lot of different things that are going on in their minds but i think you know those students are having these conversations and it's a matter of like making sure that they have the resources to attract as many people, whether they're second or third generation Asian American, um, to like be in those conversations. So I think it's a matter of providing groups that on college campuses that are doing this work with the resources so that they can like continue to have these conversations and like empower second or third Asian American second or third generation Asian Americans to like be involved and like become more knowledgeable. I think I can speak to this because when I was in high school, I like also didn't really understand what it meant to be Asian American. It was, hold on. <laughs> okay, yeah, so I didn't really understand what it meant to be Asian American in high school, like the intersection of these things together. I think that at various points of my life, I described them as disjoint identities. There being an Asian side and then there being an American side. I think a lot of people still don't understand that, but coming to college, I think that being involved in student organizations and as a result of student labor, people hosting workshops and like other students more knowledgeable than me educating me or people that pour resource in, sorry, resources into our community like North Carolina Asian Americans Together or API Vote. Together we've done workshops such as like No History, No Self, No History, No Self, like K-N-O-W and then N-O, but like Knowing what has happened in our history because we are erased from it and then taking ownership of our identity, knowing or like something that was really powerful, powerful for me was learning about how identifying as Asian American in itself is a political identity just because of the history of like Asian American organizing and what that had to do with solidarity between other ethnic groups and how before we were characterized as Orientals, but then we came up with this label for ourselves. And all of that having to do with being politically engaged, I think really changed my outlook. And then trying to change things for the future, hosting more workshops like this for people, especially with NCAT's help. Like they helped us put together an event. We worked with Sangam, our South, South Asian Students Organization and also the Asian American Students Association, which is like a combination of coalition building and education, which is like really awesome. Continuing work like that and teaching people. Other question? Oh, go ahead. In the front. Me? Yeah, uh, I, I just get such a rare opportunity to actually talk to folks that are, are, that are on campus uh, in your age group. And I'm reminded that uh, when 9 11 happened, many of you may not have been even alive. And so my question was um, you know, I know it's anecdotal, but just a snapshot of your own <laughs> network of students that you interact with on a regular basis. How much is there awareness? I don't want to make assumptions, but awareness that Normal is not okay. The status quo that many of us uh, in progressive organizations that you know that was never okay, and we were trying to fight oppression, right? But is there an awareness of how abnormal and how dangerous the time we actually are in this political moment? And uh, just to be more explicit, having a white nationalist running our federal government, like, is there an awareness of that? I don't want to make assumptions about where students are at. I'm just, if you could just share what you're hearing from your, you know, your networks. I mean, I definitely think as the generations, or like as students, as the generations go, grow up, like they're a lot more woke than we are. Like the high schoolers now are a lot more woke than the college students now. And I think they're getting woke with like every incoming freshman class, which is really exciting. I think there's definitely awareness that it's like a normal time. Um, I don't know if that translates into like civic engagement and political participation, but I think there's definitely awareness. 
this. And I didn't even see that with like a lot of the March for Our Lives stuff. <laughs> I think there's a lot of awareness at UNC Chapel Hill just because it's like quote unquote a liberal campus. Whether or not it's radical is another question. But for example, there's things like we have a Confederate, or we had a Confederate statue, but protesters tore it down, which is pretty cool. But people understood that that's like a white supremacist symbol. Even if they don't know the intricate histories about all of the white supremacist symbols, how they're mass produced and put as deliberate symbols of white supremacy, people still understand that's not okay to have on a college campus or anywhere. And knowing that there's President Trump in office, I think there's like, people know that it's not, <laughs> I think that people are generally aware that a lot of the things that are going on are bad, even if not necessarily the history of it, or like all of the policy and like, intricacies of every issue, people do generally care. And I agree that people in every generation are becoming more socially conscious, probably because there's more and more bad things happening that people are just like, oh, there was another school shooting. Like that could happen to my high school or college. And then they get, it's personal, so people care. And then it continues. When you go and talk to new students to recruit them to help them, you know, to help volunteer for your cause, I wonder what are the triggers other than gun violence in schools? Is net neutrality an issue that triggers them? Is uh, technology free press, freedom of speech, that kind of thing on campus, does that trigger them? What are the trigger issues? JP, I know that you work with some students. Do you want to take a stand? <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> If your mic works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it takes them. Does it? Oh, no, it doesn't. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we'd love to hear from the other panelists as well. I, I'm, I'm happy to share. Um, I actually think that a lot of our students and young folks are actually most in tune for like some of the some of the like the brightest like the brightest issues that have like a lot of spotlight on them, whether it's like Parkland or whether it was around gun violence, but also I think um, when, when, family, when, when the family separation issue got really big in, in June, I think the narratives that were first lifted were, were really from a lot of young folks that were actually asking and demanding for mobilization um, and seeing that all across the country. And so I, I think, I'm not sure if there is one, one hot topic or issue than, than another, and at least less so than it's ever been in part because information travels faster than it's ever had. Uh, it's the, the universe feels smaller because access to the information of what's happening around the world is, is, is just a lot more accessible, uh, not just because of social media, but because I think just the conversations in the environment around it are happening a lot faster. Um, I mean, that's, that's really been my take so far. Usually when I'm talking to a young person about it, it's not their first conversation that they've actually had about the issue. Um, even, even with issues that we've centered within our organization for 30 years. Um, so yeah, I, I think for me, I mean like, I think environmental justice is something that has been lived right now that, that I think is, is always huge and it's, has, has, um, has been a conversation that every time we ask right now, like what's the issue that's on the front of your mind? It's like, well, what, well what's gonna be happening with our, with our globe in four years? <laughs> so I think like, for us, like, that's, those, those are issues that have like really come to the forefront, uh, but we'd love to be leader from others too. I don't know, like, if there's a list of, like, the things that, like, millennials slash Generation Z care about. I don't know, but I think it's, I think it's more or less things that you'll see trying on the internet. So I think essentially things that are in the public consciousness are generally pretty high on the list of what young people care about. I don't know, again, I don't know how that translates. I think some people go to protests and some people don't vote. At the same time, I think people engage online a lot, but they don't necessarily go vote. So I think it's a matter of like translating that into actual participation. But for sure, I think it's like gun violence. I think there's a lot of um, just around like LGBT issues um, in Texas, like you know, sanctuary cities. Um, there was like a bathroom bill that was really, really unpopular that didn't get passed. Uh, like a transgender bathroom bill. So things like that. I think there's oh, all right, go ahead. okay. I think there's also a lot of situations that have to do with empathy that inspire people. Like for when I lived in my first year dorm, it was the one right next to Sorority Row, which had a lot of white girls trying to rush 
white sororities and a lot of them cared about certain issues that were more I don't know, like sexier or like easier to get behind, such as environmental justice, like they wanted to recycle, but which is really important, but also <laughs> things that made people care were stories about sexual assault on college campuses. A lot of people, even if they aren't the most politically aware or aware or refuse to call themselves political, even among AAPI friends, you probably know someone that might have been sexually assaulted and then they'll care about that. Or there was a film that was made called The Hunting Ground, which featured UNC Chapel Hill specifically, and people that have been, like they're really personal stories and interviews that have made people really feel. Like the things that elicit visceral reactions, I think are the things that get people to care, which is also I think gun violence is such a successful platform because people have literally died and that makes you really emotional to hear. And also the fact that there's such young people, high schoolers speaking out against it. It's really motivational. Thanks for sharing, Sabrina. I know I've been looking in this direction, but there have been questions in this direction. <laughs> <laughs> or anyone else has some questions? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, honey. <laughs> Uh, so I have a little bit of a, a nuts and bolts kind of a question because I think a lot of people are interested in engaging youth. Uh, so it's more on how do you recruit and then activate those youth and also for sustaining it. Um, I think Jonathan, you had a really interesting sort of trajectory in the youth that you're working with where you started with like five interns and now it's like 30 plus. And what kind of, what is the structure that you had that actually build that up and were there any key points where you're like, okay, this is what was key for us to actually make it to that point? Yeah, um, I think, so the structure that we have is, you know, we first, before even starting about a summer program, we actually thought about what, most students just want to be able to know more and they just need a place to be able to receive political education regularly throughout the year. So we created this program where folks can meet twice a week and just be able to learn be able to engage in conversation. And we, the way we actually did it was, we, the, the biggest partners that we actually had was faculty on, on schools, whether it was like teachers, whether it was professors, in large part because they knew that there was political education they couldn't provide in the classroom because of how, I, I, I think, based on what our values were, and they needed to know that there was a place in Orange County to be able to do that. So the way we did it was actually, part, we actually built a relationship with faculty for over a year just being able to say, we want to be able to come to your classrooms. And we actually started with like maybe 30 class wraps, just basically going in front of a classroom, speaking for three minutes to five minutes, and actually engaging, uh, engaging professors and students, uh, starting with our first cohort of like, like, I think it was like 12 volunteers was coming year round for like once or twice a week. That turned into those five interns during the summer. Now, I, I think for the scale that we do in terms of class wraps, just to kind of give scale, we probably do probably over 160 in a year. Um, and actually have the students actually leave the class reps and actually build the relationships with professors and actually like increase the network of the professors that they've interacted with would be interested. And it'd be, you know, and I think for us, that's really kind of the way that we've actually increased our base. And I think the second way that we actually learned after we built that infrastructure was actually through direct actions and actually just mobilizing young people all the time. Um, actually, this is the first year where we've actually engaged and have folks recruited through Facebook live stream, in large part because they saw us on a stream, they're like, I want to do that, and they, I want to learn how to do that, and that's the way that folks engage, because oftentimes we are asked to participate in direct action, but rarely do we know how or why we do it, um, and so really for us, like we wanted to be the school that not only engaged people electorally, but actually mobilized people to the county board, or mobilized people to the sheriff's office, mobilized people to our Congress member's office. Folks want to be... Folks are angry and frustrated. They need to be able to show and have a place to express that. And we give that. And not only do we give the space, we teach how to do it. Um, and so I think for us, like that's really kind of, it's like really just our model of organizing and adapting it to the schedules of young folks and to be able to actually provide like the specific skill sets that are rarely spoken about um, and actually just showing our playbook. Because the reality is that like, it's, it's we don't, none of us really have like a secret formula that's gonna like bring us to like 2021 really. I, I, I think we're like learning every year and adapting. 
And we're just transparent about that. And I think our folks really, and they get to appreciate, they get to actually build our model out too. Like we give so much flexibility. The reason why a lot of us were successful last year in regards to like the dream action was in large part because we, like it was youth led. Um, I mean like our, our youth really led a lot of the ideas for the actions. And so we just give the infrastructure and they really provide the energy and the ideas for us to be able to execute to be successful. Thanks, JP. So unfortunately, we're going to be a little out of time because we're going to give you all time to do small groups. But to close this section out, I want to give you all on the beautiful panel uh, an opportunity for some closing thoughts. So you can go out of order or in order. First, want to think of a thought can start. But just some of your final thoughts and final things you want our audience to think about as we exit this panel. Okay, invest in like young people on college campuses. Um, I just want to say that like APRA Vote like reached out to me and Quinan like last year, and we had we were like I think vaguely engaged people. I don't think we actually would have started doing like um, like all the voter registration that we did if it wasn't for the program and like just having the opportunity and having like resources to do it has like very much kind of changed both of our lives and like the sort of things that we want to do. And like I think just giving people opportunities and like resources is really important. And like people have passions and they don't necessarily know how to express them. So like invest in young people, y'all. Do it for the long haul. We're in year two of a 10 year plan. I don't believe that you're going to see immediate results. I hope for immediate results. But what I'm really looking for is what we're going to result with in 10 years, right? And there's milestones as you go there. So when you approach this, don't approach it like, okay, this didn't work, and so we're going to stop, right? You should approach it as a long-term plan. <laughs> I like, totally blinked. Um, I, I, I think... Utilize youth organizing to be able to open up the other avenues of what kind of organizing you can do. The strongest organizing group that we actually had that emerged this year that wasn't here last year was actually organizing our parents now of the folks who were organizing our youth. And our parent group in some ways have become like this, one of the strongest mobilization forces for our programs this year. Um, and, our, and so I think for us, it just lifts different. So I think for me, just realizing that youth organizing is is like the strength of youth organizing is that it opens up a ton of other possibilities that we can't imagine. Never really thought about that three years ago to emerge youth organizing to multi generational organizing, but it has. Um, and so for us, like that's, and then I think that your youth organizing, the, the youth city engagement piece will only be as strong as the youth organizing you do before and after. So if we're not engaging and politically activating our, our young folks, uh, and our members, and centering their leadership year-round, then it becomes less effective year-round. So I think for me, uh, it's, it's a simple thing to say. It's really hard to practice, and I, that comes from personal experience, but also understanding that like, this, is, and this is our opportunity. This is, this is our opportunity to be able to build. I agree with, with a lot of what's been said, and I think that something that everyone's been saying is to invest in youth, and I hope everyone in this room also understands that already, but something that I'd like to add on to that is to actually take time to listen to and respect what the youth, quote unquote, are saying. Um, I think that a common thing that a lot of me and my friends share or people that I've met in the API community is that a lot of people older than us, maybe because of culture or hierarchies within our own communities or just like age in general, is that we don't feel as if our voices have an equal sitting at the table. Even when I talk to my family about issues, they're like, what do you know? Like, what have you really gone through? Which is to some extent true, but then also if we're trying to give power to people that don't really seem to have much of it, or like, okay, let me rephrase this. We're trying to give power to a younger generation of people. And I think that there is a lot of power in our generation and the leadership or the amount of power that we'll have in 
voting and the issues that we care about. But then if you know this and don't really respect what people are saying, then I think that really goes to show something about how much you really respect people and listen to them. I think it's important to, going back to like the point of what do people care about and how you want to engage people, it's important also to ask the people that are our age, like what, do you, what are you angry about? And then actually truly listen before speaking. And so like, just to summarize, like actually listen to the people that you claim that you are trying to cater toward and then respect. Um, I don't, yeah, okay, it's on. Uh, I think for us, one of the things that it's sort of intuitive, is, I guess it's a closing thought, but just to really remember that so many times adults, whether they're funders, whether they're the organizational leaders, we um, many times impose our structures and our deliverables and our expectations on the young people, and it sometimes looks very different when it comes from the young people. So, you know, there was a question about the issues and I didn't answer that, but one of the things that came up among our youth that was a common problem that they decided to work on was food bullying. And it was something that actually had incredible ramifications in bringing the youth together because they found that the urban and suburban uh, youth as well as sort of um, places of high density API and low density API in the schools still faced the pretty similar food bullying. And so food bullying, oh, I see Susan's asking what is that? So when, um, for instance, uh, I take a spicy rice dish to school and it has an aroma and then people start making fun of me. So that's food bullying. And that was something that sort of was uh, was uh, common across the many ethnicities in the youth groups, and they chose to work on it. And it ended up being really successful. It led to participatory research. It led to a whole bunch of other stuff. But uh, you know, very honestly, that wouldn't have come from a funding perspective, from an adult perspective. That would not have been what they would be charged to work on. So uh, I just want to reiterate that that listening piece and really thinking hard about what youth-led looks like um, a lot, it requires a certain amount of humbleness and stepping aside, truthfully. So I, I'm sorry, we can't have any more questions, and I just have two final thoughts. One, I'm so proud of our ambassadors. Like This was one of the programs I started. Literally, I started two weeks at AKM, and Christine was like, put a youth program together, I'm like, all right, okay, we'll figure something out. And to see how much our, our ambassadors have grown is like really awe-inspiring and I'm like tearing up because I'm like so proud of you all. I'm so happy.